Francesco? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah, great. I can hear you too. <laughs> How are you? And thank you for joining us. <laughs> thank you very much for hosting me. And I'm really happy to be virtually thank here you. with you. Yeah, virtually. Unfortunately, virtually. Really hope someday, uh, maybe next year. Yeah, we, 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 will, we will be really glad to host you. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for being in this talk. I'm, as we just spoke, I'm Francesco Tiziot, and I'm a developer advocate in a company which is named Ivan. What we do at Ivan? Well, we offer open source data platforms on top of the major clouds as managed sources, managed resources, sorry. Uh, the cloud of ch the choice of cloud includes like all the major cloud, Google, Amazon, Azure, for example. The choice of open source data platforms includes, of course, Postgres, but also others. But let's not lose too much time on this. I'm here in order to share with you what happens when you use strings well, but also when you start misusing strings and what could happen in really worst scenarios. And now you can basically dig yourself out of those scenarios with some of the functions that Postgres provides us. So, you know, I like to use my sessions in order to bring to people a concrete example. And in order to find a concrete example here, I didn't have really to go far because, you know, I'm a lucky person. I'm a lucky person and if, Yes, we are here we are. And you know, I'm lucky because no matter where I go in the world, I have such a name that is almost always misunderstood. So if I go in Italy, people usually they don't understand my name, my surname, sorry. So they start calling me uh, Tizio, uh, Tiziotto, or Tiziot or just Tizio, which is the Italian way of saying body. When I go outside Italy, now people don't understand my name. So they usually call me Francisco, Francisco's, or just Frank specifically, specifically when I go to the UK. So what are all those things? All those are really strings. And, you know, strings are beautiful because we can throw pretty much anything we want into a string and the string will not complain about it. The string will be able to hold it. So we can use strings in order, for example, to store names like my name, Francesco. We can store entire sentences like I come from Verona and I like football. Of course, I'm Italian and good food. Still, we can store it in a string. But we can also start misusing strings. If you think, for example, what's behind an image like this, that is a string. And if we want, we can store it in a string in a database. And now I'm going to touch parts if you are an experienced DB users. I could store entire list as strings. I could define a D separator that I want, and I could store list as string. Now sit like in a in a good place because now the horror story starts. If you check this number, $1,200, you think it's a number, but it's not a number because it has the dollar sign. So it's not a dollar, uh, number, it's a string and you can store it in a database, a string. Even more, check this. This is a date, but you know, people will refer to this date as 25 January, 2021, 2501, 2021. If you go to the US, this becomes 01 25 2021. If I don't want to have problems for people in inserting strings, inserting dates, I can store it as a string and problem solved. You know, this might be completely out of the world scenarios, but I've been in the data industry for quite some time and I've seen here and there l something that looked like this kind of scenarios. So believe me, you will probably will not want to face, but possibly you could face some of this misusage of strings. So in order to bring you a concrete example, I took one of my favorite things, which is eating and eating out. And I came up with the usual way that I book a restaurant. So I call my favorite restaurant and I say, 
hi, I'm Francesco. I want to book a table for two people. On the other side, there will be uh, someone receiving the call that will write down all the details and reply, okay, Francisco, your table is reserved. And you know, this kind of misunderstanding happens a lot in verbal communication, but it's not only limited to verbal communication. If we expose our database in a website that is exposed to a lot of users, they will want to write all the details in Harry and they have, like me, fat fingers. So they will mistype their name, their surname, their email address. And, you know, this kind of data quality issues happen in any kind of case. So going back to the restaurant idea, I try to come up with my favorite restaurant won't, won't willing to move out from the analog booking on uh, book and moving out to their favorite technology, which of course it's Postgres. So what they did is basically they created a table in Postgres and they start adding columns into it. They start adding an ID, which is a serial, pretty okay. Then they added the color name and the color surname to strings. Then what else they, they added? They added the email because they want to use it for marketing purposes. They are kind of an advanced restaurant. And also the booking day, uh, sorry, the phone number, because you know they want to call me if I don't arrive in time. Next is the booking day. As before, different people will have different methods of writing down the same date, and they don't want any problem while inserting the row in the database because they want to reply fast to the calls. So they use a varchar. Last, they also added an interest column to capture all the interest that I'm uh, willing to share in order to give me the most personalized experience possible for my dinner or lunch. The last column is people. They want to know for how many people I want to uh, set the booking. And you know, I could say it's for five people. It's for four plus one, meaning for adults, one kid. It's for different formats. People will use different wording in order to express for how many people they will book a table for. They start using this table and it's amazing because as soon as they receive a call, they can fill all the details and the booking goes through. At a certain point, they want to start analyzing this data and they find out that this is basically chaos. They cannot really dig out the information that they want. They cannot understand if for certain day they are full of not or not. They cannot even understand what their customers are because they find that quite some sort of strange behavior. For example, they want to find out how many people sounding like my name and surname they have in the database. And they do something like this. They find out that there are five different rows with people sounding more or less like Francesco Tizio, but none of them are equal. If we dig into the details of this data set, basically we have, the ID is probably the unique column which is working correctly, which is a serial, but then color name and color surname. We have here both misunderstanding and mistyping. We have variation of the name and the surname, and also we have weird accents that have been added in both the cases, both for name and surname. Let's move to email addresses. We have a mix of valid and not valid email addresses. Check the line number three. It has a dollar sign instead of the at, and also a mix of private versus business addresses. Let's move to phone number. We have various formats of phone numbers. If you check the second line, it looks like a valid phone number, but it has a name instead of probably a six. And then I have some numbers with the plus 39, which is the Italian prefix. Others are not. The last row is a date. And if we check the date, the last row is a phone number. So the person writing down the details swap the two columns. And then other booking dates have the second row. Is that the 10th of May or is it the 5th of October? We will never be sure about that. Check the second to last date, the 31st of November in my calendar doesn't exist. But still, since we are storing that as a string, we cannot validate it. Let's move to interest. We have a huge variety here because if we give people the freedom to define the delimiter, they will come up with the favorite delimiter. So we have commas, semicolons, dashes. 
If we check also the second to last row here, we will never be sure if my interest is football, Pinot Noir and Tagliatelle, or is football Pinot and Noir Tagliatelle, which by the way, could be a thing. Let's move to the last column, people. Five, four plus one. Is the second to last column one plus four, one adult and four kids? For to me, some madness. Uh, is the last one 55 people or five plus five? We will never be sure. So, you know, this is probably the worst case scenario. How can we start fixing it? Well, you know, we want to start fixing our data set and we possibly want to take all the rows that look like Francesco Tiziot and combine them in our unique Francesco Tiziot because we want to identify uniquely our customers. And that could be possible, but in order to do that, we need to find what is the unique identifier in our data set. Usually when you deal with users, or in this case, bookings, you use, for example, the email in order to identify uniquely your rows or your clients or your users. Why? Well, because usually the email is in pure ASCII code. So it's easily parsable and you can easily compare various emails. But choosing the email has also some drawbacks. People will use different accounts in order to do bookings. And we, I can use my personal and my work account. I can use a group account. For example, if I want to book a table for the whole um, marketing department at Ivan, I can use the marketing department email in order to do the booking. Even more with email, there is a strange, strange problem about the symbols. And this problem, the solution of this problem, depends on which provider you use. For example, with Gmail, you can add as many plus and dots to your email, and all the resulting emails will be aliases to your original one. So for example, tomhanks at gmail.com is the same as tom plus or tom.hanks at gmail.com. But this is valid only for Gmail. It's not valid for all the other providers. And also with emails, you know, they can be reassigned. So for example, if in 10 years, Francesco Tiziot joins Ivan, they could, a new Francesco Tiziot, not myself again, a new Francesco Tiziot joins Ivan, they could take my email. So, you know, all this makes using the email as unique identifier a little bit hard. And also when you're trying, no matter what, which unique identifier you will use, it will be a really manual process that will usually depend on your data set. And I cannot give you general rules on how to combine different users within your data set. You will also probably encounter some edge cases. For example, two people with the same name living in the same building, but they are different people. So, you know, this happens. And you will have to do some sort of automated step, but also some manual cleaning of your data if you want to group them. On the other side, we can admit that basically we know that entropy never decreases. If we keep on going what we have been doing as of now, we will never be able to have clean data. But what we can do is to change our strategy to start sorting our tables and putting all the information in order in order to avoid the future chaos. So now I believe it's even too much for slides. I want to show you the example in practice. So what we will do now is I will use a Postgres instance that I created on Ivan. And as you can see, you can create your own instance. And it's not only Postgres, it's also a lot of other open source technologies. But I want to show you how you can basically solve the problem of my favorite restaurant in Postgres. So I have already created my Postgres instance, as we saw earlier on. And now I can connect to it with the Ivan command line interface that will fetch the connection parameters and we connect with psql. So now I'm in the database. Let me now recreate the same data set that I was showing you before. So the table is my restaurant data. I insert my five rows and let me show you that the five rows are exactly the same as we were showing before. 
So the same problem with the name, surname, email, phone number, booking date, interest, and people. Now let's start solving all these problems. And let's start from the end of the table, starting for, from the people column. One thing that I always say is that if you want to perform mathematical computation on top of a column that is something more than just a count or account distinct, the column cannot be a non-numeric format. So in this case, we know that people will book for a number of adults and a number of children. Let's add those two as two different columns in our new table. Even more, if we know that we have also other requirements that people usually ask, for example, a lot of people will ask to be seated next to a window. So we can add that as a new column. And believe me, it's better to have a new column, an extra column, which is empty 99% of the time. But if I need the information, it's just easy to select than having the same information hidden in an unparsable string. So having a column for next to the window makes sense. We can still leave a general comment section where people will be able to write whatever they want. And we can periodically review the comment section in order to check if we need to add additional columns. For example, we may need to add a, a number of vegetarians and vegans column based on the comments. So now that we have this new uh, numerical columns, we can insert pretty much the same data as before, and we can verify what we have in the data. So we have that the original booking for, for was for five people, and now it's five adults next to the window. Four plus one was four adults and one kid. If we check the one plus four, it was one adult and four babies. So we can also now, since those are numbers, ask an additional question. Are you sure to come with four babies by yourself? And well, with a comment, we are pretty sure that th this is a valid booking. They need help. They are with four kids. They probably will want to sit next to, I don't know, toys or something like that. The booking for 55, it was for five adults and five kids. And you know, it's a, um, it's a burley, but since we have also the capability of, of numbers here, we could also have a check that says if the booking is for more than 10 people, ask an additional question to verify that they are correct into, uh, on the number of people for the booking. So, you know, with using integers in this case or numeric formats, we are able to solve the people problem. Can we go to the next one? The next one was the interest column. The interest, as we can see in the original table, was containing kind of a mess here. Always the same three fields, the same three values, because I'm consistent. I always love football, Pinot Noir, and Tagliatelle, but with different delimiters every time. We cannot parse this easily. How can we solve this problem? Well, the first theory is to use the third normal form and create a separate table with the reference to the client and then the list of interest. Or since we are in Postgres, we can use arrays. With using arrays, I can insert the single values and you know, Postgres will take care of containing all of them in a unique column. Once they start, that I start using arrays, I can also use all the functions that are coming with arrays. So if I want to go from an array to a list of rows, one row for each item in the array, I can use the unnest function. And there we are, I have one row for each of the values. Even more, I can, for example, if I have multiple arrays, I can play with all the array functions. So for example, if I have a person that has interest in Pinot Noir and Tagliatelle, and another person which, has, which is interested in Riesling and Tagliatelle, they have an intersection. I can verify the intersection with the intersection function. And you know, Pinot Noir and Tagliatelle and Riesling and Pernetta, they don't have anything in common. Again, it's easy to verify using the arrays and all the function that comes with them. So can we say that also arrays solve the interest problem? I guess so. Let's move to the most touchy problem, I would say, the booking date. 
you know, what did we have in the original column? Complete mess. Uh, dates, another date in another format, the 31st of November, which is not the date, and the phone number. Again, this is pretty much simple. If you are storing a date, use a date format. But you know, some people could say, I don't want to lose the way that people can express their dates, but you're not losing that. Because, you know, as long as together with how you write the date, you pass also which is the conversion string, you can express the date as you wish. Like we have very different way to express a date. Still, if we pass the conversion string, you always come back to the exact date. And you know, you could give the user the ability to express the date as they wish, or possibly you could also force what I suggest correct ways of identifying a date, which is uh, day, day, month, month, year, 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 or the opposite, starting from the year, then adding the month, and then adding the date. All the others are probably, oh, I wouldn't suggest that uh, in order to, for example, build a website that needs to talk with the world world. Okay, if we use a date, we have also some safeguards. The first one is when we try to insert something that is not a date, we will receive an error. Also, if we try to insert a date which is not a date, like the 31st of November, we will get an error saying that the date time is out of range. This is not, not a valid date. So also using the date solves the horrific problem of having an unparsable date. Let's try to move to the phone number. Phone number, we had phone number in various formats, plus 39, without plus 39, and the date. What we would like here is to do a step back. What I'm going to show you now is a very simplistic view on how you can check if a precise column follows a precise pattern that you have in mind. I will use the phone number, but this could be used, for example, as we will see later for emails or in any column where you expect the content to be in a precise format. So let's say for sake of simplicity that my uh, restaurant is only dealing with uh, people that will call and will have a phone number that will be, you know, plus something, plus two items, then something dash something dash something. This is the string. What I can do is I can check if the existing strings are following this pattern. And I can already see that the bottom three are not following the pattern. The top two are following the pattern. But still, if you check the second row, I have an A instead of six. This is not a valid phone number. But I can do a little bit better. I can use regular expressions and be more precise. And I can say that I expect a plus, then two or three numbers, then three numbers, a dash, other three numbers, a dash, other three numbers. If I check this, now it verifies correctly that only the first row in my data set is following the pattern. And you know, I cannot only do the check after the row is inserted, I can do that while I insert or update any row in my data set. In order to do that, I can create a domain, domain called phone number that does the check using the regular expression that we just spoke about. Now that I have the domain, I can create a table that has a column called P number using the domain phone number. Since I'm using the domain phone number, if I try to insert the correct phone number, the insert goes through. If I try to insert the phone number with an A, I have an error because it violates the check constraint phone number check. And the same goes with all the other rows that I tried to insert before, like the one without, without plus 39 and the date. Let me show that I now only able to, I'm only storing the valid phone number. And you know, this is a very simplistic example, but you can take the rule and apply it to your case when you expect a certain format. 
for email, we can do something similar. We can use the uh, CTEX uh, extension and we can write a really easy regular expression. If you don't trust me, well, uh, it's not my regular expression. I took it from a nice Stack Overflow discussion and I will share it with you the link at the end of the presentation. So we can create also the domain for the email and we will use it later. Let's now focus on the last two columns, color name and color surname. What can we do here? Well, probably the first item that we want to use or to remove is removing all the accents because in Italian at least, they don't make a lot of sense. Again, this is probably something that will change between languages, but I took my experience and I'm sharing with you. In order to remove the accents, there is a nice extension that you can use called an accent. And as the extension says, it has an an accent function that just does the job. So you send it a string and it removes the accent. So there are no more strange characters on my right column. But you know, this only removes the characters. I want also to possibly, when someone in the restaurant receive us a call, give a hint if the person or the name or the surname that they understood at the phone is a client which is already existing in the database. So I want to check if a string that they are saying in input is similar to another string which is already in my database. And you know, in order to do that, I can use the extension which is called fuzzy string match. This extension has a couple of really nice um, functions. The first one is the Levenstein difference. What is that? Well, it's pretty simple. The Levenstein difference counts how many characters of difference there are between two strings. So if two strings are equal, like in this case, there is a zero difference. The second string, there is an E here and an I there. So there is Levenstein difference of one. CE against SI, Levenstein difference of two, and you can go on and on. So what I can do now is, for example, if someone calls and I understand that name and surname is Francesco Tiziot, I can write a query using both the an accent and the Levenstein difference in order to say, look that this was the, um, the person calling, I have another string in my database is Francesco Tiziotti that after the an accent uh, like this, that has only one of Levenstein difference. So you could already understand if there is someone with more or less the same name. But you know, this probably works fine if I understand the name correctly. And possibly also if I only deal with other people speaking the my language. Because if you take Italian and other languages, but this is valid for any language generally, the same sequence of letters creates a very different sound. So specifically, if I receive a call and I have to write the name down, I could write it completely different if I speak the native language or not. But likely for us, um, Fuzzy String Match has also another function that can help us, which is called Soundex. Soundex associates a sound to each word. So for in this case, it says that Tiziot sounds, uh, associates the code T230. The same for Tiziotto and the same for Tiziotti. This means that those three strings, they sound pretty much the same, while Tizio and Tizioppo, they sound a little bit different. Now, I would like, like the Levenstein difference, to compare a string for the which uh, that, that I understood with other strings that are in the database. And for that, there is a nice function which is called difference and does the soundex difference. There is something to learn here. The function is called difference, but it's a tricky name because the result is always a value from zero to four, where zero tells me that two strings sounds completely different, and four tells me that two strings sounds exactly the same. 
this case, what this says is that tzioth sounds like tzioth because the uh, sound x difference, the sound x score is four. The same for tzioto and the same for tzioti. While tzio and tziopo they sound a little bit different. So now you know. Now I have both the Levenstein and the sound x, and I can mix and match those in a unique function to re to send back to the person receiving the call, all the list of existing clients that I have in my database for which the set of characters is similar or for which the sound is similar. So I have all the little breaks in order to build my solution. Let's build a solution for my favorite restaurant. First of all, we will detach the client information from the booking information. We don't want to write again and again every time the client information for every booking. So we will create a separate table called my restaurant client with an ID, a name and surname, which are Varcha. Email is now using the email domain and phone number is using the phone number domain, as we found out earlier on. Interest is now an array of Varchar instead of being just a string. For the booking, I'm doing something similar. I have always an ID, which is the booking ID. I have my client ID, which is a foreign key referencing my restaurant client ID column. I have the booking date, which is now a date, number of adults as integer, number of children as integer. The comments is still a global string. The primary key is my client ID and booking date. So I'm forcing not having the same person booking twice for the same date. Because, you know, I could reserve tables only because a person changing his mind about the number of people in a precise booking. Okay, now that we have the two tables, let's add some helping function, helper function that will allow us to retrieve data having similar name of a name that we pass. And we retrieve any row that we have in my, our client table with a sound X score that is greater than three. So only the strings that sound similar and a Levenstein difference, which is less than four characters. And we can do this for the name. We can do the same for the surname. And also just because we are here for the email address. Now, let me fake the fact that we create the solution and the restaurant already started with some good bookings and, you know, uh, started with, sorry, with some good clients. So now I have four rows in my existing database, a row from Francesco Tiziot, Ugo Rossi, Uga Bianchi, and Francesca Verdi. Those are all valid clients. Let's now mimic the fact that we receive a call at the, client, at the restaurant and someone says, look that I'm Ugo. Do I have already a Hugo in my database? I can use the helper function, the similar name, passing Hugo, what I understood at the phone, and it will, it will tell me, look, that you have a possible two options in your database already. You have Uga Bianchi or Ugo Rossi. Can you ask now the surname to the person? If it says it's Rossi, well, probably I can already match it with an existing client. Let's check my favorite one. I call and, you know, people understand it's Tiziotto. How can they sort this out? Well, you know, because we remove the accents and sounds the same as Tiziot, they will have the hint of an existing client there. Someone books uh, sending us an email and the email address is ugo.rossi at email.com. Well, I had already a ugo.rossi at email.com, which is close enough. You know, I'm using the helper function in order to solve similarity problems. Let's try now to insert into our client table something which is an email address, which is not an email. Violates the check constraint, email check. So since email is now checking with a regular expression, this tells me that this is not a valid email. Is this an error from the client or it's from the person writing it down? We will have to fix it before we are able to insert the uh, row in the database. Now, now that I have my lovely data in my database, let me show you again. I have this interest 
And you know, now that I have the interest as an array, as I said before, I can use the array function. So for example, next week, I want to organize a new dinner uh, focused on Pinot Noir. Who should I invite? Well, Pinot Noir equal to any of the interest will tell me, please invite Francesco Tiziotta and Uga Bianchi because those are interested. You know, I don't have a lot of imagination. What kind of dinner theme should I set up for the following week? Well, again, I can basically unpivot this information. So check that spaghetti is the interest with most people interested into it, three. And those are the people. And you know, if you want to create a dinner about spaghetti, invite the emails, send them the emails. So now having proper data sets, proper data formats in my client table allows me to do whatever I want. Also, if I want to organize the tables for people to talk a little bit about the shared uh, interest, I can say, I want to sit Francesco and Ugo in the same table because they can talk about spaghetti. And Francesco and Ugo, they could talk about Pinot Noir. So, you know, you can do a lot with this since you have the arrays. Now, the last part, let's make a booking. I want to make a booking for myself. I was, uh, let me share with you again. Um, there we are. I'm, I have the ID one. So I want to make a booking for myself, ID one, for the 23rd of November, four plus one. And I want to sit near the window staring at Verona's arena. It's amazing view. The booking goes through. You know, um, I did a mistake. It's not four adults and one kid. Actually, um, my wife has to go to the arena to see a musical and I'm there with four kids. I try to, oops, uh, there we are. I try to do the booking, but since I'm inserting a new row for the same date, it's telling me that violates the unique constraint that forbids a same client to have two bookings on the same date. So, you know, I can do the update saying, sorry, I, this was my previous uh, booking ID. And I want to update in order to say four kids and one uh, adult. And the update goes well, and now everything is correct. Let's try the last one. Uh, some, someone else, ID equal to three. So Uga Bianchi tries to book for an non-existing date, 31st of November doesn't go through because we are using a date and it tells me that the 31st of November doesn't exist. So now I believe in almost 40 minutes, I've been showing you how you can go from a really messy situation to a situation where you have everything under control. Let me go to the last couple of slides. So we went from chaos to order. Some more references that I believe you will find possibly useful. Those are all the things that I've been talking about. Array function, date function, pattern matching in order to, to, to check if a certain string follows a certain rule. Create domains in order to push the check. Create the email domain. And this is a shortcut to a long URL taking you to Stack Overflow and all the discussion about how and why you should create the uh, email domain like that. An accent function, fuzzy string match extension, and last, if you want to give a try to all this function is now safe and quick environment, well, check Ivan.io because we offer that as a managed service. And possibly you could also move your production services if you trust us enough. Thanks a lot. If there are questions, I'm